Hair care enthusiasts, are you ready to elevate your hair game without breaking the bank? If you are, this will be very interesting to you. Divi will give you an exclusive $10 off discount on all premium hair care products. But to claim this fantastic offer, all you have to do is visit their website at DiviOfficial.com slash Linwood 61174. Whether you're looking to nourish your locks, revitalize your scalp, or want a serum for hair growth that actually works, Divi has you covered. Visit DiviOfficial.com slash Linwood 61174 and unlock your $10 off discount now. In the vast expanse of ancient texts and mythologies, there exists a figure shrouded in mystery, a woman whose very name evokes curiosity and intrigue. Lilith, the supposed first wife of Adam, is a character whose story has been told and retold throughout the ages, often changing form as it passes through different cultures and eras. Where did she come from, this enigmatic woman of legend? Who is she truly? According to Jewish folklore, Lilith was created at the same time as Adam, fashioned from the very same dust of the earth. Yet unlike Eve who would later come after, Lilith was not content with being a subservient partner to Adam. Her story unfolds as one of defiance and independence. Lilith's narrative takes us back to the dawn of creation when she and Adam were placed in the Garden of Eden. But from the very beginning, their relationship was marked by conflict. Lilith, refusing to submit to Adam's authority, left the Garden in a bold assertion of her own will. Some tales suggest she fled to the Red Sea, where she consorted with demons and became a powerful, dangerous force. In other stories, she is portrayed as a temptress. In others, she is a protector of women and children. As the legend of Lilith evolved, she became associated with dark and mysterious aspects of mythology. Her name has been linked to night creatures, seduction, and even the taking of infants in their sleep. She was seen as a symbol of unbridled feminine power, a stark contrast to the traditional image of a submissive and obedient woman. But beyond the myths and legends, Lilith's story touches on themes that resonate deeply with us today. She represents the struggle for autonomy and self-determination, particularly for women, in a world that often seeks to constrain them. Her defiance and resilience echo through the ages, challenging traditional narratives and sparking discussions about gender, power, and identity. As we explore the depths of Lilith's story, we find a character who transcends time and place. A woman of strength and mystery, whose legacy continues to captivate our imaginations and challenge our perceptions. Whether seen as a dark force or a symbol of empowerment, Lilith remains one of the most intriguing figures in the pantheon of mythological history. But is there more to the story? Did Adam really have a first wife called Lilith? There is no clear evidence of her from within the Bible. So where does she come from? The origin of Lilith is found in the fifth alphabet of Ben Sirah. It reads, While God created Adam, who was alone, he said, It is not good for man to be alone. He also created a woman from the earth, as he created Adam himself and called her Lilith. Adam and Lilith immediately began to fight. She said, I will not lie below, and he said, I will not lie beneath you, but only on top, for you are fit only to be in the bottom position while I am to be the superior one. Lilith responded, We are equal to each other inasmuch as we were both created from the earth. 
but they would not listen to one another. When Lilith saw this, she pronounced the ineffable name and flew away into the air. Adam stood in prayer before his creator. Sovereign of the universe, he said, the woman you gave me has run away. At once the Holy One, blessed be he, sent these three angels to bring her back. Said the Holy One to Adam, if she agrees to come back, what is made is good. If not, she must permit one hundred of her children to die every day. The angels left God and pursued Lilith, whom they overtook in the midst of the sea, in the mighty waters wherein the Egyptians were destined to drown. They told her God's word, but she did not wish to return. The angel said, We shall drown you in the sea. Leave me, she said. I was created only to cause sickness to infants. If the infant is male, I have dominion over him for eight days after his birth, and if female, for twenty days. The alphabet of Bensira is dated to anywhere between A.D. 700 and 1000. This work has been labeled as satirical, but is it pointing to something more profound? Or is there nothing more? Or maybe there's nothing more than just this myth. Maybe it's not a myth. Maybe we are supposed to take this myth as being true. Maybe this is an actual woman. Maybe this is an actual woman that has been distorted somehow. Maybe there is nothing more profound. Or maybe there is. Maybe there is from the perspective or through the lens of the Bible, but maybe there is not anything more profound from the perspective or through the lens of general Jewish mythology and folklore. Maybe there is something more profound that we, that we may be missing, that we are missing. Maybe there is something beyond the stretch of a folklore's imagination. Just looking at this uh, piece of writing here. The ancient name Lilith derives from a Sumerian word for female demons or wind spirits. The Lilitu and the related Ardat Lili. The Lilitu dwells in desert lands and open country spaces and is especially dangerous to pregnant women and infants. Her breasts are filled with poison, not milk. The Ardat Lili is a sexually frustrated and infertile woman who behaves aggressively toward young men. The earliest surviving mentions, the earliest surviving mentions of Lilith's name appears in Gilgamesh and the Hulupu tree, a Sumerian epic poem found on a tablet at Ur and dating from approximately 2000 BCE. The mighty ruler Gilgamesh is the world's first literary hero. He boldly slays monsters and valiantly, vainly, boldly slays monsters and vainly searches for the secret to eternal life. In one episode, after heaven and earth had separated and man had been created, Gilgamesh rushes to assist Inanna, goddess of erotic love and war. In her garden near the Euphrates River, Inanna, Inanna lovingly tends a willow, hulupu, tree, the wood of which she hopes to fashion into a throne and bed for herself. Inanna's plans are nearly thwarted. However, when a dastardly triumvirate possesses the tree, one of the villains is Lilith. Inanna, to her charging, found herself unable to realize her hopes. Chagrin. Found herself unable to realize her hopes, for in the meantime, a dragon had set up its nest at the base of the tree. The zoo bird had placed his young in its crown, and in its midst, the demoness Lilith had built her house. Wearing heavy armor, 
brave Gilgamesh kills the dragon, causing the zoo bird to fly to the mountains in a terrified Lilith to flee to the desert. Now one has to, one has to think because the Lilith that we associate, or I should, I don't know if we want to say we, the Lilith that is associated to the Adam of the garden is a Lilith that was constructed, a Lilith that was constructed by a rabbi AD 700, AD 1000, around that period of time. The Lilith of that narrative, is she, could she be, most likely maybe, drawn in character and rehashed and replayed, reinvented for folklore in the Jewish mythology, taken from 2,000 years ago, maybe more or so, in the, or from the epic of Gilgamesh. The origin of this name, Lilith. Because what I want to do is I want to I, I want to just show that this Lilith there there is really no such in the Bible, no such. And when when crunching context, when crunching language, it's it's not difficult to see the direction that the Bible goes in. And to see that the direction that the Bible goes in, it's not the direction that mythology has gone in or that we not being familiar with mythology in this day and age, where we then take that. Now, it's really interesting because there is no Lilith in the Bible. There's no Lilith in the Bible. But where Lilith is and is assumed to be taken from it comes from a a phrase or a, a natural bird found in the book of isaiah now isaiah 34 13 and 14 reads and thorns shall come up in her palaces and nettles and brambles and the fortresses thereof and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island. And the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Now, this phrase here in, in Isaiah 34, 14, Lilith. In the, in the language there, can be traced back to Screech Owl, but it's not necessarily Lilith. Let's just look at this in the Hebrew. When you're looking at Lilith, it's actually Lilith. That's the pronunciation, and the spelling is not quite Lilith either. This, this word, Lilith, it, it translates to mean screech owl. So when we're seeing screech owl in Isaiah, as it says, the satyr shall cry to his fellow, Isaiah 34, 14, the screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. This screech owl, it means lilith. It means lilith. The lilith also shall rest there. Now, this isn't Lilith, as in the mythological figure. This is not a, a woman that is here being spoken of a reference. This is an animal. <laughs> this is an animal. This is not Lilith. This is Lilith. And somehow, some way, uh, manipulation of sorts, Lilith... Um, has been has become associated to this screech owl when in reality there there is no connection there at all but the connection drawing back the connection drawing back to adam adam's first wife being supposedly and let's just stick to the narrative 
a screech owl or a lee leaf or a lilith the first wife of adam being a lilith which is a lee leaf which is a screech owl is there truth to that lilith is mythological never once ever having been any partner to any Adam. But is it possible? Is it possible that there was an Adam whose first wife was actually Lilith or a screech owl? A screech owl, might I add, which is known for camouflage. Though small, known for camouflage, and also known as an aggressive bird. Known for camouflage, known as an aggressive bird. Are these the qualities that we can think to find linked and associated and given to us by the authors of the Bible concerning the first relationship, concerning the first relationship of quote unquote Adam from Genesis. We're not talking about Lilith again as such a figure as is plainly seen is mythological in nature, both from its origins and from the Sumerian literature in the Mesopotamian side of things, and then also in the Jewish folklore. But is it myth? Is it mythology that the Adam there in Genesis 2 and in Genesis 3, their first wife was a Lilith, otherwise known as a Lilith, or a screech owl in right context of language. Let's see how the Bible articulates a certain type of female character. And let's see if such a type of female character is associated or can be associated or can be found linked to the screech owl, which is a bird that is naturally due to for its own survival, camouflage, and also known as a bird of prey or a bird of aggression. Can we find in Bible philosophical context and language anything describing such that we may be able to give some sort of validation to the things that we hear concerning Lilith and to place them and to put them into correct order for the sake of philosophical belief. Looking in the book of Proverbs chapter 9, Proverbs chapter 9, 13 to 18, Proverbs chapter 9, 13 to 18, it reads, A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple, knowing nothing. She sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. Who is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Staying in Proverbs and keeping these things in mind, Proverbs 5, 3 to 9. Proverbs 5, 3 to 9. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O you children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh 
the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. The possible character of the screech owl is actually here defined for us. The possible character of the screech owl is here defined for us. Two characteristics. There are more, but the two that I just want to focus on at this time. The camouflage and the aggression. Her ways, say the one writing these things in the book of Proverbs, are movable. Movable ways. When you think that you know what you're looking at, you have absolutely no idea what you have seen. When you think you know what you have come to believe before your own eyes, what you're actually seeing is what she wants you to see. And for the purpose of aggressively, subtly, yet aggressively, the aggression is subtle because if you're wandering there and she's calling you there and your desire will be to her, to her interest and in whatever her interest is, you will not suspect any, any bit of aggression, but you will suspect flattery. Through that flattery, all caution is thrown out the window. With all caution thrown out the window, she's got you. But you don't know, you don't know that where they are taking you, that they she, where she is taking you, is a place of no return and a place that is going to set your eyes into a zone or into a realm in an atmosphere of disguise. So while you are appearing to be in an atmosphere of bread and of water, in reality, which is veiled to your eyes, in reality, the environment is absolutely dreary, dry, not sustainable for life, and eventually you will no longer exist where you are with her. Now, maybe it's just me, but this is sounding a lot like something from in the book of Ephesians. This is sounding pretty, pretty familiar. Book of Ephesians 5, 6 through 12. I'm going to skip some verses in the center there. Ephesians 5, 6 through 12 reads, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather remove them. Sorry, but rather reprove, reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Now remember, the main character that we saw from the book of Proverbs with tantalizing lips, meaning tantalizing speech, and an appearance that is quite deceiving. They let us know that stolen waters are it, Secret bread is this. It, this, that, what we need to do. This is what's good. Counsel from the book of Ephesians. Counsel from the book of Ephesians is a warning, dear reader, to not entertain such a character. Which is interesting because the author of Ephesians the author of Ephesians, they are writing about no literal woman, no screech owl, uh, no Lilith. They're actually writing about an assembly. An assembly, a church that is deviating from right principle. And doing so both in secret and publicly by secrets. 
the idea of such as we are reading in the book of Proverbs, even though it is saying a strange woman, the, the thing to pay attention to of what this woman is to be described as or as conjuring as the, the author writing the Proverbs lets us know is house. This strange woman is and represents house. Look at, looking at Ephesians 2, 2 and 3, Ephesians 2, 2 and 3, which reads, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Ephesians 5, these workers of what is dark, this dark art, this dark discipline, they were called the children of disobedience. Ephesians 2 highlights the mind state, the mindset of individuals categorized as children of disobedience. And the mindset, the mindset is to fulfill desires and lusts, both by mind through thought, and by the body, through feeling. This is an assembly of ministers. This is a church. This is a church body. This is individuals holding fellowship with one another. This assembly is flesh-based, meaning that being flesh-based, they are routine-based. Routine-based meaning operating by some sort of or altogether through religious law. What is described in the book of Proverbs, although articulated figuratively as a woman, is not in reality a woman. We are not reading about a woman. The story is figurative. For that depiction, sure, in reality, that depiction is simply just an illustration. In concrete terms, we are reading about an assembly. An, assemblies who, an assembly whose depth, whose depth is contrary to the mind at the core of the scriptures. Their practice, their discipline, their theology, their, their theories, their routines, and their Rites and ordinances, their baptisms and such, are dark art. Dark art. And they are camouflaging that. They are camouflaging that because the individual passing by them does not know. Or they want to engage in such, consciously or subconsciously. And so they are brought in to die the death of such an experience with that assembly journey into a marriage of self-discovery with growth immerse yourself in eloquent verses that tenderly explore the bond between heart and mind unveiling the art of self-love embark on a poetic odyssey between the heart's yearnings and the mind's reflections as they come together to highlight self-acceptance growth is a collection that gracefully unfolds the intricate chapters of one's own narrative each poem a testament to the intertwining journey of love, vulnerability, and cooperation. As you turn each page, you'll witness the blossoming of self-compassion, a gradual revelation as you navigate the labyrinth of emotions and thoughts. Discover the power and the beauty that arises from valuing your worth. Growth invites you to nurture your heart and mind, cultivating a garden of self-love. Observe and embrace the journey. Explore, evolve, and find solace in the verses that resonate with your very soul. So Lilith, Lilith, as portrayed as a woman, and I'm dealing only with Bible here. I'm not getting outside of Bible. I'm not jumping into, as I am now speaking, into Jewish mythology or religious mythology or Sumerian mythology because the things that are of that mythology 
they are somehow, some way, for generations on to this age, trickled down to the Bible. And so for some reason, can't escape that because it's it's been placed and forced onto the Bible. That's I'm cutting that off and I'm dealing only with Bible here. Observing Lilith or Lilith as a woman is absolutely false according to the Bible to do. What is right to do as the Bible in Lilith, as the Bible in Lilith does, observes through screech owl or through bird. That's the right analogy, not woman, not a woman, but a bird. Why? Book of Jeremiah 23, sorry, Jeremiah 12, 8 and 9, Jeremiah 12, 8 and 9, and it reads, My inheritance is unto me as a lion in the forest. It crieth out against me, therefore have I hated it. My inheritance is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds around, the birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. The Bible itself, the Bible itself is denominating what is called the heritage of Israel as a bird. And the denominations around them as birds. The Bible is categorizing and determining the heritage, the inheritance of the deity of Israel as a bird and the denominations around them as birds. That screech owl, that screech bird, that owl bird, that bird, in reality, is a denomination, should be thought of as a denomination. That only due to the Bible creating such a contrast, its own self, with the quote-unquote heritage of, the, of their deity, associating them as birds and denominations around them as birds. Now Jeremiah 23, <laughs> Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23 and 16. Jeremiah 23 and 16 reads, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. So again, going back to that illustration from the book of Proverbs. Although it is saying a strange woman is doing this, a strange woman is doing that, to the Bible's mind, woman doesn't mean literal woman. That woman in the book of Proverbs figuratively represents a house. And the house that that woman represents is the house of a bird or the house of a denomination. Jeremiah 5, 26 to 28. Jeremiah 5, 26 to 28. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that set his snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and wax and rich. They are wax and fat. They shine. Yeah. They overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. When we're seeing bird, and keep in mind, category of bird here, screech owl. There's a specific character to this category of bird that is to be figuratively lined up to the type of character of a assembly of an assembly of a house of a denomination was adam married to someone called lilith otherwise interpreted as and put together in frame through a lilith was that adam married to a woman no that's not the right connotation the right connotation should be 
screech owl, screech owl, screech bird, that is an owl, a type of character associated to a denomination, to the type of denomination as highlighted, whose labors are highlighted from the book of Isaiah, lying in wait, deceit, vain words, slaughter, death in their houses, waxen fat, they are rich and greedy. This isn't a literal animal, and this isn't a literal woman. This is an assembly, this is a church. This is what the Bible is talking about. Lilith, Lilith, or that screech owl, actually represents a house. What is a house to the Bible's mind? Proverbs 14, 11. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. That's an easy one. Bible is making associations through contrasting terms. If the house of the wicked is overturned and the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish, a house is a tabernacle. Again, what is house? Psalm 65, 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. House equals temple. House equals tabernacle. House equals temple. Nehemiah 6, Nehemiah 6 verse 10. Afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehatabil, who was shut up. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. Again, house equals temple. What does house mean to the Bible's mind? 1 Timothy 3.15 but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. To the Bible's mind, house means tabernacle, house means temple, house means church. Lilith, in reality, is not a woman. Lilith whose root stems from Lilith, somehow, which actually may not and doesn't, but somehow, translates to Screech Owl. The reality of this is, is that an assembly, a tabernacle, a temple, a church, is what is being referenced. Not a woman, not a literal woman, not a mythological woman, not a bird, not a literal bird, not a mythological bird. An assembly, a denomination. Now, from the way that it's written, it's not difficult when you go back to the book of Genesis to see, to see that that Adam was married to a denomination. Genesis 2 and verse 7 reads, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man, in this staying in the script, from dust of ground. Adam from dust of ground. What is dust to the Bible? Isaiah 41, 2, Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, made him ruler over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword and as driven stubble to his bow. What is the them that was given as the dust? What is the them that was given as the dust? Nations. Nations. To the Bible's mind, dust equals nations. Isaiah 40:15. Isaiah 40, 15, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Again, dust equals nations. And this is not nations as in political. This is ultimately nations as in denominations. 
Genesis 13, 16. Genesis 13, 16 reads, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Dust equals seed, seed equals nations, and these are not nations as in, again, political. This is nations as in denominations. To hear of one raised from the dust of the ground is to hear of one raised from the denominations, from the foundational ground denominations. That narrative from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2 is the narrative of an exodus. An exodus, not of a literal man being created and formed out of literal dust. This is an exodus. And this Adam is not a literal man. This is an assembly themselves. It's an exodus, the story of an exodus, the retelling of an exodus, of an assembly out of an assembly. The retelling of an assembly out of an assembly. So was that Adam married to a Lilith or a Lilith, which is a screech owl? And that screech owl being identified as a house, a strange house. Which house is a church or tabernacle or temple? The answer is yes. The first wife, the first relationship of that Adam in Genesis 2 and 3, they were first married to a screech owl that was created and generated within Genesis chapter 1. And again, not a literal bird. This is a denomination founded upon principles of robbery. Robbery to those that have a conscience for well-being. Not robbery for them. This was the Lilith, the Lilith, the screech owl, the house temple tabernacle that that Adam was taken from up out of, separated and situated into a terrain and territory of their own. So when you think about it in the context and through the narrative that the author writing the Bible gives, folklore may have it that the first wife was Lilith, whose origin, mythologically, is one of sexuality, lust, desire, evil, witchcraft, whose story resonates with feminism and the power of gender, the female gender, may resonate with all of that. But when you take what Bible gives you and you look at it from what Bible gives, there is no Lilith in the Bible. Somehow that tradition and that folklore gets seeped down into the Bible only due to that one phrase in the book of Isaiah. Only due to that one phrase in the book of Isaiah, meaning in the Hebrew, Lilith. Not Lilith. Lilith. And somehow Lilith gets linked to the folklore Lilith. When you, when, if you should just look at Lilith, you will actually see that what the author there is pointing to, what the authors of the Bible collectively are pointing to, the category of bird, the category of denomination of what that is, how unhealthy that is, the camouflage of such, the aggression, the aggression and the aggressiveness of such, Tracing that back, if we will keep that mythology and we, if we want to keep that alive and to be what it will be for us, we should just keep it to the Bible. And according to the Bible, it is true and it is fair to say that the first wife, that the first relationship, 
that the first marriage of that Adam from Genesis chapter 2 going on into Genesis chapter 3 and forward was with not a woman, not a literal woman, not even a mythological woman, but with a screech owl. And when you crunch that figurative illustration down, that first relationship, that first marriage, that first wife was a denomination, was a house, was a church, was a temple. Not a good one. Hence the need in Genesis chapter 2 for a creation scene, a second one. Authors didn't get somehow mystified or lost in their train of thought between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. There's no slip up. This is in a different narrative. This is very intelligent. With what's there written, Genesis 1 and 2. There's nothing, there's nothing mysterious about that. When you follow the narrative and when you follow the train of thought that's given in Genesis 1, it actually bleeds perfectly into Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 is the chapter of Exodus and placement. That one risen from out of the dust is one risen from out of denomination. That first wife, that first wife was cruel and abusive, made no sense too sensual and flesh-based, fulfilled only the desires of mind, fulfilled only the desires of heart, without perception, without thought, without empathy. That Adam in Genesis 2 was actually a slave. And if you look at it from the perspective of that screech owl of that house of that lee leaf they too were a slave in that relationship separation was necessary and so the mind the mind that brought that adam out of that marriage regenerated that body from out of that denomination situated and separated them by themselves in a territory just for them until a more suitable or until a supposedly more suitable mate could be found and constructed. So the topic is interesting. The topic is interesting because it's not a lie. It's not a lie. The first wife, yes, was not a Lilith. The first wife, yes, was, was not a Lilith, was a screech owl, was a screech owl. And not saying that a, a person was married to a bird. This is, again, I'm staying the Bible. This is figurative illustration. And when you're looking at, at, looking at it from that perspective and crunching that down to the context and language of it, that first, that first marriage was to an impure assembly Resurrection was needed, separation was needed, and into a terrain that was more suitable for mental and devotional growth and development. So the subject is really interesting. The subject is beyond, once you allow the Bible to speak, fascinating, because everything traces right back, and I've broken, I've broken Genesis 1, 2, and 3 down enough, which I won't do, but when you it all traces back down to those chapters, and you can see the, the necessary exodus. You can see the necessary exodus, and you can see that that first marriage was not it. Was the second marriage it? But it's fair if we're going to want to keep that mythology, at least if we want to believe it's something to use Bible to be able to further it and in a way that is relevant as opposed to simply some Jewish folklore constructed AD 700 to the to 1000 going back to Gilgamesh making sense of it from Bible it allows it to hit home harder and and that's pretty much the essence of of the, the Bible's raw spirit and mind 
to allow its reader and student to understand the change that it must make personally for personal growth and development and the benefits that the sphere around it should have through through it and them and and that change also Knowing Bible is a course for learners wanting to grow closer to themselves and to their Creator. There is a reason why we trust the Bible. There is a reason why the Bible moves us to celebrate it. There is also a reason why we feel hesitant to let the Bible's words satisfy us. Traditional religious theory isn't always satisfactory. Carrying a belief without proof will soon aggravate our thoughts and feelings. Knowing Bible is a course that is designed to wake us up to who and what our belief is. Knowing Bible is for learners that want a living experience beyond conventional religion. Don't let this educational opportunity slip away from you.